think we're going to get started. It is a little after seven as more people come in, but I just wanted to say hello and thank everyone for participating in this community input session of our climate action plan update. Uh, my name is Amy Cuthbertson. I'm the director of finance and the assistant township manager at Haverford Township. Um, panelists will be Jada Ackley, who will introduce herself, and Peter Puglianisi, who is co-chair of our township environmental advisory committee, and also Jeff Hancock, who is coordinating the meeting for us. He will be coordinating the Q&A and the, the raising of hands and all that stuff. He is our communication manager here at the township. So the township was fortunate enough to be selected to participate in the Pennsylvania DEP program that will give us the tools we need to, in some, for some municipalities to institute their own climate action plan and in our case to update ours since we already have one. Uh, we are still in the developmental phase of the plan update, but one of the crucial components of that is community input. And that's what we are right now. And that's the role that everybody who has thankfully participated is going to be joining in and giving us their thoughts and opinions as we develop the structure for the update that we're going to be producing. Um, couple housekeeping measures. Um, there are about 38 participants on the call. Um, to participate, please raise your hand or use the Q&A. Um, Jeff will coordinate and call on you to, to voice your concerns, opinions, questions, things like that. Uh, all attendees are muted until Jeff unmutes you to speak. Uh, there will be polling questions, so please participate in those when they become available. Uh, the meeting is structured for one hour, but we do have until 8.30, so that's not a hard stop, but I, I do want to be uh, respectful of everybody's time, but we do have until 8.30 if there's good dialogue going. Um, if there is an area that you want to expand on that we either had to stop short to keep moving or that we just didn't get to, please email any thoughts and concerns that you weren't able to express to that same email address, the Haverford LCAP at havtwp.org, and they will be taken into consideration. And finally, this is being recorded and will be available on YouTube tomorrow, probably around midday for anybody who missed it or anybody who knows colleagues or friends who missed it and wants to chime in. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jada and Peter largely who will be speaking. And uh, again, thank you for participating and we really do appreciate it. Right. You cannot pull that up now, Jeff. Good on your end, Jada. Yes, thank okay. you. Again, hi everyone. Um, welcome to Exploring Climate Change in Haverford Township. Um, my name is J.D. Ackley, as she mentioned, and I'm here on behalf of a program with uh, Pennsylvania's Department of Environmental Protection um, in conjunction with ICLE USA. And before I get started, I wanted to just again, thank you all for taking the time uh, to join me here and for also expressing interest in uh, your township's climate action planning process. And I also wanted to thank the Board of Commissioners and Greg Vitale for supporting some of uh, the resolutions that encouraged a number of initiatives and also participation in this program. So you can move ahead. Again, um, this program was made possible uh, through participation in um, the local climate action program uh, through the DEP and ICLE USA. Uh, so Haverford was selected alongside 20 other municipalities um, to be assisted in creating a robust climate action plan so that um, Haverford Township is better prepared and better able to manage the risks and impacts of climate change. Uh, the township worked with ICLE in 2005 to establish its initial climate action plan and through participation of this program, it has the opportunity to update that plan. So which is where this meeting sort of comes in and you can uh, forward. So I'll be presenting for a bit just to review um, some of what you are may, already may know in terms of climate change, um, its impacts, what the township has done and is doing and where you can fit into all of that and uh, make meaningful changes in your own home. Um, and of course, there will also be some times for questions that you may have um, and uh, a poll that I have for you all and some additional open-ended questions um, to complete that uh, sort of community input portion. So please stick around for that. So for uh, next, please. Okay, so just an overview. Um, 
climate science at a, at a glance for consistency's sake, I'll uh, reference the, um, the Department of Environmental Protection's Climate Change Impacts Assessment Report, unless I know otherwise. But um, what do we know about climate change and how? So the earth is always in periods of warming and cooling, but what's been revealed by a climate science is that both the rate and the degree of global temperature change is being accelerated by increased amounts of heat trapping compounds, uh, most notably carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And this is primarily from uh, human industrial activity. Um, and that graph on the left sort of illustrates pretty plainly the correlation between um, increase in global temperatures and CO2 emissions. Um, but there are of course other influences um, that exacerbate climate change with greenhouse gas um, emissions being the main culprit just to echo why um, emissions reduction plays such a significant role in addressing climate change meaningfully. And to the right um, is just sort of an illustration on a macro level of some of the indicators of climate change being here. Um, just the amount of record-breaking temperatures experienced across the globe uh, demonstrate a sort of off balance um, in terms of climate. So next, please. So how has it already impacted us here locally? Um, well, in our state alone, we are already experiencing some of um, those changes primarily in these three ways. Uh, over the last century, we've had an um, increased daily temperature of 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, also data collected from North, the Northeast Regional Climate Change Center shows that between the years of 1985 and 2010, the frequency of heavy rain events in our area also increased by 70%. And additionally, in 2017, the um, Department of Health um, alongside the CDC noted that the cases of Lyme dis disease in our state tripled, um, which ca caused it to be the highest um, rate of Lyme disease in any state in the country. And uh, even more observationally, we have um, our past hurricane season as sort of a testament to the um, intensity and frequency of tropical storms, uh, such as Faye and um, Isaias, which uh, contributed to a lot of flooding and um, creek overflows and public and private property damage, as well as um, power outages across the township. So that's some of the ways that we have already felt uh, the presence of climate change. Okay, next, please. Okay, so in the coming years, uh, those aforementioned impacts are projected to be felt even uh, more prominently in three, in three ways. Um, again, uh, per participation is expected to increase another 8% by 2050. This is uh, due to the fact that the um, surface of the earth is about 70% water. And as the global temperature warms, more of that water is evaporated from our oceans and lakes and other bodies of water on the surface. And with every one degree rise in temperature, the atmosphere is able to hold 4% more water vapor. So uh, during those periods of rain, um, the downpour is increased and intensified because uh, it has the ability to retain more moisture, which of course increases the severity of flooding and other um, damages. Also, Pennsylvania is expected to warm another 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit by 2050. Uh, so just a warmer uh, average temperature across seasons um, which is another indicator of a, a global climate change. And in our case, in southeastern PA, that means uh, while seasons may be generally warmer, it will create a host of other issues. Um, mainly one of them being uh, an increase in habitat suitability for pests um, and invasive species, such as ticks and mosquitoes. Um, According to the EPA, the life cycle and prevalence of ticks, uh, specifically deer ticks, is strongly influenced by temperature, um, meaning that the ways that the climate is changing in our area encourages um, suitable conditions for 
um, disease carrying ticks and mosquitoes and increases the amount of time that they can live. Um, so these impacts uh, don't occur in a vacuum and they have additional um, impacts for us to uh, be considerate of that we'll take a look at in this next slide. So those aforementioned changes um, sort of compound in really negative ways in these three main areas. So uh, we know that public health is connected to environmental health in a myriad of ways and the health of the local environment can be uh, indi indicative of the health of the local community. So with uh, warmer average temperatures, we could expect to see an increase in poor air quality days um, that can lead to higher instances of respiratory illness uh, like asthma, as well as increased risk of heat related deaths for more vulnerable populations in the community. Um, warmer and wetter uh, conditions also, as mentioned, lead to an increase in um, cases of vector borne diseases because of the conditions that they provide for those types of uh, insects and also can lead to an increase in mold and allergy causing pollen. Um, again, uh, to the, speak to the local economy, um, it does, is not removed from the impact of climate change. Um, accompanying an increase in precipitation uh, does mean in a higher instance of damage to uh, local roads and infrastructure um, and private property. And uh, something worthwhile noted in the climate change impacts assessment is that uh, the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency estimated that in 2018, severe weather caused approximately $125 million of damage in public infrastructure due to flooding and landslides. And nearly half of it was not covered by federal disaster aid, meaning that the um, expenses had to be absorbed by local county and state agencies, um, which uh, just emphasizes the need for preparedness and participation across the township to uh, really be braced for those types of conditions. And last but not least um, are the impacts on local ecology. Um, as touched on earlier, because of the changing weather conditions, there are different invasive plant species and pests um, which are already here in our region that could increase in abundance and overtake native plants that play uh, specific roles in balancing our local ecosystems and also diminish uh, biodiversity even further. So that was a lot of um, more unpleasant information, but it is the reality of the situation that we have to work with. Um, and fortunately, the township has already done a lot of the groundwork, so to speak, in terms of using this um, opportunity for change uh, to sort of mitigate some of these impacts and adapt to the coming ones. So if we move to the next slide, we can take a look at some of the work that's already been done. Great. So. Um, since the initial uh, climate action plan with ICLEI in 2005, uh, as I mentioned, the township has been committed to a lot of the work necessary uh, in order to reduce local emissions. And while um, a lot of these efforts are indicative of a dedicated and thoughtful township, there are a, a few more recent aspects that um, are worth highlighting uh, because they uh, will be continue to be built upon in this updated climate action plan. Um, but also worth noting is um, the amount that the township was able to save uh, and also able to reduce in terms of emissions by just swapping out the LED uh, streetlights. So that's just a, a, a prime example of what you can gain by implementing some sustainable measures. Uh, next slide, please. And most recently in 2018, the Township Board of Commissioners committed to 100% clean renewable electricity by 2035 and 100% renewable energy for heat and transportation by 2050. And um, 
to help the township achieve those goals. Um, there was the collaboration between the Sierras Ready for 100 Club um, and the EIC to launch Solarize Delco, which we will talk a little bit more about um, and some more of those getting involved section. Um, so next slide. Okay, just so keeping in mind um, the achievements that have been made, but it is important for us to know um, where Haverford Township stands now in terms of emissions and um, you can't manage what you don't measure. So this is an emissions profile that was produced from ICLE's inventory software using uh, 2015 emissions data for the township. And without dissecting it too much, we can see um, where the most room for improvement um, is, and that is between residential energy use and transportation. So this is where um, the, the 2035 and the 2050 goal of achieving 100% renewables um, is uh, crucial in um, engaging the entire township, as you can glean from my note there. Um, and this is being uh, championed by the establishment of Solarize Delco, um, just to really ensure that residents have um, accessible ways to join um, the efforts in, in achieving this goal. And um, uh, as mentioned, the township has been able to make significant changes with the municipal um, buildings um, but ultimately those um, energy grid use changes in the residential sector are going to be a lot more meaningful and a lot more necessary now in achieving those overarching goals. So next slide, please. So there are a lot of benefits um, to helping uh, this cause and to um, committing to some of these changes. And while they may seem that they require a lot of effort initially, these changes um, ultimately end up benefiting you and the community you're a part of overall in a lot of different priceless ways. So um, just a few of those are saving taxpayer money and boosting the local account economy. Um, as mentioned, um, and as our as Pennsylvania's state government works to achieve its own reduction goals. Um, there have been more programs to reduce renewable energy costs to citizens, businesses, and other institutions. Uh, this is supported also by the fact that the demand for energy efficient products and services um, and for new and alternative energy and technology is increased, um, which if implemented at your uh, business can um, make you more attractive to customers and also help to create some local jobs and um, support you, the local economy while also being resilient against uh, climate change's more destructive uh, forces that can ultimately end up hurting the economy. Um, and back to public health, uh, reductions in uh, greenhouse gas emitting activity means less immediate air pollution, and um, that in turn decreases rates of respiratory related um, illnesses. It also um, reduces reliance on energy intensive vehicles, which can put a greater emphasis on the use of uh, public transportation, um, which also combats air pollution and helps facilitate more sustainable land use, like uh, increased biking, biking and walking infrastructure, um, which is also a more uh, healthy and less energy in intensive in terms of carbon um, form of mobility. Uh, the, these efforts also can help um, support the health of our local ecosystems um, that provide us with a lot of uh, services that we sometimes take for granted, um, adaptation efforts like uh, uh, implementing a rain garden at your home, um, tree planting or uh, creating a green roof can help to balance uh, our local ecosystems by reducing pesticide runoff, 
helping to sequester carbon from the immediate air, as well as uh, purifying the immediate air and um, helping uh, keep it, keeping invasive species in check, um, which all make our local ecosystems a little bit more resilient. So um, if any of those benefits sound worthwhile to you, then stay with me for the next slide and we can look at some ways that you can get involved now. So as mentioned, uh, one of the largest um, uh, needs in achieving the overarching goals will be to get the community on board with solar and with renewable energies. So to sort of spearhead that Solarize Delco um, is a program that is available to homeowners, businesses, and nonprofits. Um, and they will, if you email them, you can get an assessment um, on your home and they have group discount pricing available. Um, so this is definitely going to be one of the ways, um, one of the more direct ways that you can be involved with some of those um, reduction goals. And although energy consumption patterns uh, are the most significant catalyst of climate change, uh, the aggregation of your individual efforts on the community level can help to make the township itself a more climate resilient and cleaner and greener place. And uh, to do that, you can support uh, some more individual climate action efforts, um, buying renewable, switching uh, to electric vehicle, um, adopting a more climate friendly um, diet uh, consisting of like less animal proteins um, and more locally grown produce uh, when possible. Of course, composting uh, can have a beneficial impact on your immediate environment as well. And um, the township has a program where you're able to get a subsidized bin for $25 um, after the training. And you can contact um, have for compost or have compost at gmail.com for more information on that. Um, you can also request a rain garden at your home that helps with local, with mitigating local flooding and um, is also beneficial for our local ecosystems. And for any of those, um, for any of those practices, if you find yourself needing assistance or more information about how to get started, the have switch at gmail.com email is available um, for you to seek out assistance. And also if you want to uh, do more things outside of the home that um, engage your township in a wider uh, way, you can contact um, the, or you can visit uh, Haverford's Environmental Advisory Council Facebook um, and email that have switch address to find out about how you can get on board with their meetings and um, get involved in other ways to uh, incorporate or incorporate your own business or your own um, organization. Um, into some of the practices that they preach. So that was a lot of information. Um, I, next slide, please. I am um, hoping that you have some questions or comments or concerns. And if not, then I have some for you. Okay, well, while we're waiting, I just, uh, this is Peter. Um, I, I did want to emphasize, I saw there were a few questions about the climate science. I, I did want to just mention that um, Haverford has been, has recognized and has been planning, as Jada said, since 2005. Um, and the plans have always included a government operations and a com community component, but I think the important uh, piece of this and the challenge is the fact that the community, that the, the township operations over which it has more direct control represents really only about 1% of the um, 
greenhouse gas emissions for the community. And so that's why um, the emphasis on what, what can the community do and, and really the plan update here reflects, we had a plan in 2008, which reflected the 30% reduction goal. And as Jada mentioned, the township has actually for its operations has met that goal. The community at large has really not. And so I think it's important to set the table for that, that the community at large is really the bigger challenge going forward now that the community's goals have gotten more ambitious for 2035 and 2050. Um, the, the challenges ahead are even greater. Um, and so the community is, is, is the, probably the most important and perhaps the most difficult component of that. We do have, um, sorry, there is one question. Do we want to get to that now? Sure. Let me just double check here. It says, what is the source for the 5.4 degree Fahrenheit between now and 2050? That is far higher than SP, excuse me, IPPC or the SPCC state. I think that is over a longer period of time. So that number is from the, um, the Department of Envi Environmental Protection's um, Climate Change Impact Assessment. And I believe they use uh, NASA and uh, NOAA da data. I can drop that report in the um, um, in the chat for your viewing. Um, however, I'm not seeing. I don't think I have the option to view the chat. Jeff, is that? I'm not. Uh, well, perhaps you could provide a written answer to the question. There is a Q&A window. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I was muted there. Um, there is no chat, but people can submit their questions Q&A wise, and then I can read those oh, or okay. they can be shared or they can raise their hand and we can unmute them and they can ask and have the conversation with you. So um, is there a way um, I could have this um, assessment, this report that I'm looking at sent uh, to the question asker just so that they can they have the document? It was anonymous, the person who- oh, okay. Um, we can always share whatever documents you have with all the registrants. So anybody okay. interested can follow up they like. Yeah, it's, I think it, they would, um, they may en or enjoy or um, learn a bit from this assessment because okay. yeah, so the state overall is, ex Expected to warm another five point so four. So we do. We do have one attendee who has raised their hand. So I'm going to bring Rob in, if that's okay with you, Jada. Yep. Yep. Hey, Rob, you should be good to talk. You can paste the URL in the in the Q and A box, and then everyone will be able to see it as an okay. answer. Since we don't have the chat enabled. Yeah. You can just go in and paste it, uh, assuming you have the ability to answer questions. And then everyone, I believe, will be able to see the answer. At least that's the way it's worked in other webinars I've participated in. Okay, great. Thank you, Rob. Okay. So uh, while we're waiting on more questions, I did want to return to uh, that prior slide with regard to the things that individuals could do. So that's one of the uh, things that EAC has been focusing on with uh, over the last few years on climate is um, outreach to the community, education. Um, and so 
for those of you who want to learn more about individual action, things that you can do, um, I would suggest uh, searching uh, for Haverford EAC Facebook page and there's information there. And the YouTube, uh, Haverford EAC YouTube channel has um, many of the workshops that we've done over the last few years that have, um, that we've done on a variety of topics, um, including um, how, to, how to purchase renewable energy, uh, making the transition to electric vehicles, climate friendly diet, uh, as well as solar home. And we recently did one on um, solar houses of worship, uh, things that um, uh, faith communities can do uh, to uh, transition to solar. Um, Composting as well as an interesting one. one. There are a lot of uh, resources on, uh, you know, evaluating your own life choices and what effect that can have. Now, we all know that, uh, you know, while um, one individual um, has perhaps a limited impact by doing those things, if none of us as individuals do it, uh, then we, we don't make progress. So we, we do need action on a broad scale from individual to, you know, municipal, county, state, and federal government. Um, but so the challenge for us in developing this long range plan is, you know, what are the, what are the most effective strategies that we can use um, in our community to accomplish the things uh, that we have set as goals for ourselves. Um, and so some of these resources are really designed to uh, lower the barriers for individuals to act because any of these things do have, uh, do have uh, effort involved, change is never easy, even something which now many of us find simple, uh, like purchasing renewable power uh, is an obstacle to, um, to some folks. Switching to an electric vehicle certainly is an adaptation. Um, so some of these resources are designed to um, lower the barriers. And in particular, this have switch at gmail.com is really a place to get individualized assistance because one of the things that um, we know from um, being involved in public events um, is that sometimes uh, people do need a lot of attention to understand how to make those changes. And so we have people in the community who are willing uh, to give their time to um, explain to people how to do this. So um, anyone who's interested, please take advantage of that. We could uh, move to the poll questions. Actually, if we could just take, there was another question. Okay. Post, I don't know, Jeff, would you mind reading that just before we, so we, we answer that attendees question? You're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. A question from another anonymous attendee. I think you mentioned that the township has a goal to use 100% renewable energy for its electricity by 2035. Isn't that achievable immediately by switching to a renewable energy supplier? Um, if, you don't, if you don't mind, I could just add a little bit on this. Um, we are currently in a procurement contract for our electricity and that is in effect through December of 2022. And that was part of the, the way we financed some of the street lights at the, in the early stages of the street light replacement program. That's how we financed phase one, two and three um, through a part of it was to procure our energy earlier and, and kind of tie ourselves in for a few years. So that is over in December of 2022. So as we approach that, uh, we will be going through the process 
to buy a more renewable sourced energy, but that's why we can't do it immediately because we already are committed to a uh, energy procurement through December of 2022. Uh, also, as you might know, I don't know if all the attendees know, but the commissioners are considering uh, solar panels and um, solar energy. So that will also come into the discussion as, as the months go and get closer to the time where we will be looking at that energy procurement uh, probably maybe this time next year. Well, this is uh, th this is Peter. I did want to add that um, that the question is is an excellent one, and you know we've thought a lot about climate over the last few years, and we think in terms of easy lifts and hard lifts, and really um, purchasing renewable energy is an easy lift. It's easy for the township to do. Uh, it's easy for individuals to do, and yet the market penetration of renewable in Pennsylvania as a whole is not that great. Uh, and that is because people are not making those choices, right? It's a combination of factors, including, um, you know, or is the capacity there as well. But I, I think that's going to be one of the easier things that the township does, and indeed one of the easiest things that individuals can do um, is to purchase um, renewable energy. We do have another question. And I, I just wanted to just one other topic on that um, energy. Right now the township has is procuring a nuclear sourced energy while while obviously not optimal. Uh, we did try and move in that direction a few years ago when we entered these contracts. So hopefully we'll be able to build on that. But right now it's a nuclear sourced energy. We have three questions now. Start with the first one. Plastic we hear a lot is not going into recycling and is being burned in Chester. Recommendations being made for recycling and trash. Are there any recommendations? Uh, I recommend that all residents do a great job recycling. Uh, but that is correct. Any plastic that is uh, mixed in with the trash ends up uh, being incinerated. Um, yes. Okay, we have three more. You want me to just keep running through these? Sure. Okay. I think the goal has been met by township government procurement. That goal is stated for the residents, right? Well, technically, I mean, it's a goal for both uh, residents and the township, but um, through the um, nuclear, the, the switch to the nuclear supply, uh, essentially uh, that's been achieved in the interim. I think the, the objective in the next procurement is going to be for um, renewable low carbon power source and perhaps some component from installing solar on township buildings. And that's gonna be evaluated over the course of the next year or so. Okay. And the next question, how many private homes have installed solar through the Have Solar program? Okay, well, it is uh, actually technically solarized Delco, although, most of our uh, most of our systems have been in Haverford, mostly because the volunteers are in Haverford, and we really would love to get a, a wider reach. But um, Melissa may be able to chime in better. But I believe um, in 2019 the figure was eight systems, and in I'm sorry, 2019 and 2020 I think it was 12 or 13. Um, and the, there's actually one large, uh, I think 44 or 46 kilowatt system that uh, is going to go in um, on uh, one of the churches on Brookline Boulevard uh, once they get their roof repaired, which has been a little bit of a difficulty this winter. And next question from Ashton. I understand that individuals may choose to engage climate change as they wish. However, I'm concerned about how our tax dollars are being spent and understanding 
as with LED lighting, what is the ROI act, what the ROI actually is, including over what time? Where can we find this information? Well, that was actually on one of the slides. Um, but um, yeah, I think the, the vast majority of the things that the township has done, and this is a little appreciated fact that um, most of the things that townships can do and individuals can do have significant payback. Um, and uh, probably the best, uh, the, the, the most rapid payback is still energy conservation measures, uh, LED lighting among them. Um, and so there, there is substantial payback. So, um, you know, you invest, you get a return on investment and that's uh, true to varying degrees for uh, most of these measures. Okay, and next question from Thomas. Does the township plan to initiate a public information plan, signs, posters, etc.? For instance, we have a love is love, women's importance, all lives matter in our yard, but would gladly post one with climate change initiatives. So glad you mm -hmm. asked that question. So uh, we actually, this past year, we just uh, started putting out lawn signs uh, and we have three different ones available. And if you email that have switch at gmail.com and, and just say, I want a, a lawn sign for three choices, electric vehicle, um, ask me how I purchased renewable power ask me about my solar power system on my home. So, and uh, although, although it sounds a little archaic as a means of outreach, what we found with those lawn signs is people really are interested in lawn signs. So if you want one, please email us because we, we, we have many more to give. Just a reminder, if folks want to raise their hand and ask their questions instead of typing them, they can totally do that. Our next question from Steve. Has single stream recycling been successful? Oh, you're oh, muted, you're muted, Amy. I laugh at people when they do that, and here I am doing it too. Um, I was just going to say from a, a financial standpoint, we have seen the, the rates, and you might have heard us talk about that during budget presentation, the rates of recycling have really, um, you know, fluctuated over the past two years, especially where we used to, even further back, we used to be compensated for recycling, and now we are paying, which, which is fine, that's just the way it is. But right now, um, I think there still is some oversaturation. Um, some people on the EAC might have some more insights, but financially, we are still paying rates that you know reflect that oversaturation. But on a good note, they have come down from where they were um, towards the third to fourth quarter of last year. They were really high, and that was probably the highest we saw. Um, and, but our recycling numbers have climbed over the few years, which brings our trash down or at least keeps that stabilized. But, but again, just from the financial standpoint, we have seen it go up pretty dramatically, but we are starting to see it come down. So I just wanted to add that. And, and I think in terms of effectiveness, you know, how much are we recycling? What is the quality of our recycling? Uh, it's a subject of a lot of discussion in EAC and I'm sure uh, within the township. Um, it's not stellar. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I, I don't want to cast stones, but I see it in my own household. It's a challenge. <laughs> so. Next question from Lydia. I have tried various providers of renewable, renewable sourced energy over the past several years and in all instances ran into the cost increasing three to four times the original quoted cost after a short period of time. I do realize the cost will be more than fossil fuel sources, but need to stay within a certain budget. Will EAC recommend providers that will be more transparent? I am so glad you asked that question. I, I will point you to... Um, uh, the Haverford EAC YouTube uh, video on buying renewable power. So this is a big challenge for whether you're buying renewable or from anyone. 
uh, which is it's sort of a wild west market out there for uh, third party power providers. And there's some simple advice uh, in the video, which is uh, there's an excellent uh, resource. Well, number one, <laughs> before I say anything else, mark your calendar. Okay, so it, buy a fixed term uh, contract, six months, nine months, a year, mark your calendar, do your research, pay attention to what the new price is from your existing provider and switch if necessary. Unfortunately, um, the, um, the law around uh, the third party power providers is fairly lax. You can uh, buy month to month uh, plans, which can be astronomical. You saw the effect of this in Texas Unfortunately, uh, uh, three or so weeks ago, uh, people didn't recognize that the um, open market plans that they purchased uh, were just gonna float uh, and, and, a, and a disruption like that could, could result in astronomical. But we've, and anyway, we've all experienced that. The solution is relatively simple, which is mark your calendar and do it again. Uh, I did wanna make a pitch. So the video has some information about this, but there is a website called makebenproud.com, uh, which is the best website for procuring renewable power that uh, there is in Southeast Pennsylvania, better even than the PUC's papowerswitch.com website. So I recommend that. Jada, would you like me to launch the poll while we're doing these questions? Um, I do. Yeah, uh, you said we can do them simultaneously. We should be able to, yes. Okay, yes. Okay, so the poll has been launched. And we have more questions here from Anonymous. I don't know if this is the right time or if this is coming up later, but in the 2005 CAP, there wasn't much discussion of either environmental justice, making sure the environmental burdens aren't being felt disproportionately by poor minority communities, or carbon emissions that we are exporting, i.e. we buy used cement that is pr produced outside of the township, so those emissions from producing cements aren't necessarily counted. Are both or either of these things being thought about in this new CAP? Well, uh, Jada, you, you probably know the answer better than I. I mean, it is a very, very compli complex um, problem, climate change. And, you know, the emissions are really, really go beyond some of the things that are in your direct control. You know, you purchase a washing machine or a car and there, uh, there are... Uh, carbon emissions associated with those things. Um, I, I think that's beyond the scope of the plan, but Jada, you may have a better answer than that. Yeah, so, well, certainly in terms of uh, disposal of the township's trash, we are trying to develop a plan that is ensuring that, um, if you are not aware now, that the trash is not being uh, burned in Chester, which is a um, minority community that already is facing a lot of effects from environmental racism. Um, in terms of um, ensuring uh, non-discriminant energy, um, that is definitely something that um, when it is time to develop plans for um, where we're getting that energy from, that is definitely something that is being considered. And it's also just good if an attendee brought it up because we are doing this to kind of gauge what the community feels is important, what should be included. So, you know, we might just want to dive further, as you said, to see if there really is interest that we incorporate that component into the plan and at least investigate to see if, um, if we really should. All right, our next question from Steve again. Seems there is a lot of dirty recycling and it might be better to have clean glass, metal cans and paper cardboard recycling at a higher dollar payback to the township. We agree. 
<laughs> All right, we'll just we'll go to the next one from Ashton. Kudos t- on choosing nuclear. We are. What are your views on emergent small modular reactor SMR technology? Well, my my personal views are. I I think that's like um, the objective of landing humans on Mars. So when that technology comes to fruition among the many things that we need to solve this problem, I'll give you an answer then. Um, I, you know, one of the things that uh, we're trying to do and we're trying to emphasize is that um, this is not a future problem. This is not a future set of solutions. Um, Most of the solutions are right in front of us right now. uh, And we simply need to implement them. And if we have more solutions in the coming years, uh, more is better. All right, we have a question from Jane. Do we have the ability to initiate a single use bag ban at the township level? Well, there was an article in the paper the other day about a lawsuit which um, endeavors to lift the state, the current state ban and really constrain the state from banning uh, individual municipalities from enacting legislation on that subject. And in fact, Haverford, um, EAC and the board were actively considering such a ban um, when the latest state law restricting enacting local bans uh, happened last year. So um, I think we're all watching that court, court case uh, with interest. All right, Rob has his hand raised, so I'm going to bring him in. Yeah, hi, this is Rob Graff. I just have a, um, a couple comments for sort of amplify some of the things that Peter just mentioned. One is, uh, on purchasing your own electricity, that question is really uh, appropriate. There was a, um, art, a big study done. I can't remember where I just saw it. In the last few days, it was in either the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal that noted that um, all of the purchase programs uh, separate from utilities have raised the price of electricity. They're, they're, they, the lower price of electricity is always from the is generally from the utility uh because as you note over time that changes so in my view what we need to do is not purchase our own electricity separately but we need state laws uh to pre- to require uh clean energy everywhere because if i buy solar uh someone else is you know it, it doesn't necessarily add any solar to the grid it simply, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't change the electricity that comes to me. It just adds solar somewhere to the grid where my electricity will still come from what's, what the plants are that serve me. So I think there's a lot to be said for uh, having the requirements of clean energy in the generation, not just in the use. Um, secondly, Ashton's question about the street lights. there was a 10% return on that, which is, I think, a pretty good return on investment. It cost $1.8 million in return returns $180,000 a year in savings. And if I could get a 10% return on investments for 10 years, uh, I'd be, you know, that. and then after that, after that 10 year payback, it will continue to save the township $180,000 a year in perpetuity. Uh, and that's just the electricity savings. There's also tremendous savings in, um, in the maintenance because you don't have to change the bulbs uh, at all uh, for years, and this, those that almost that savings in labor is almost better than the year, greater than the savings in the electricity prices. And finally, I'm sort of surprised at all the questions about recycling and solid waste, because when Jada showed us the, uh, I, I do the regional greenhouse gas in, inventory for the uh, regional planning commission of Greater Philadelphia, and as she noted, the solid waste produces almost no greenhouse gas emissions is the biggest problems are uh, our homes heating, we're burning natural gas to heat our houses, using electricity that's generated using by coal and natural gas and driving our vehicles, which should almost exclusively burn oil. 
uh, only a couple percent of the emissions uh, in our region come from um, solid waste. It's not really particularly important for uh, climate action. All right, we have another question here. The township provided very specific instructions regarding what to include and not to include in recyclable items. Thank you very much for that. Could Public Works be more specific about what is allowed in brush pickup? I know leaves are not to be included, i.e. in the fall. Does it include weeds, long grass, et cetera? Did it again. Um, if I may, there is um, some extensive conversation about brush collection regulations right on our website, hvtwp.org. Right on the homepage, there's a button, uh, brush, trash, and recycling. So if you just click on there, there is, a, a, like I said, a whole discussion on what's acceptable for brush collection. And those regulations were uh, revised last fall as we entered you know, the fall cleanup season. So we did tighten them a little bit uh, at the request of the hauler who hauls them uh, hauls the brush away for us. But all that information is readily available on the website and, and easy. There's a, a clear, clear button just to click on that and there's all the information you need. All right, we have a question from Mark. Are refrigerants captured from air conditioners and refrigerators collected in bulk trash pickup? Can the township incentivize proper disposal of these items? Um, yes, they are. Those items are collected as part of brush, and that's definitely something. And you know that that's a perfect example of what we're looking for through this event tonight. Is if that's something that we should look into or suggestions like that. So, so yes, to answer your question, items of that nature are included in our bulk trash. Um, we do not mandate that they're um, recycled anyway. The hauler picks them up, and the hauler disposes of all the items. Um, as that company sees fit, but maybe that's something we could definitely dive into uh, a little deeper as to how those items specifically are being recycled and or disposed of and that we would require that be done properly. So as uh, Jay, oh, I'm sorry, Jada, um, I'm just wondering, did you want to sort of throw open the floor to uh, maybe via the Q&A window, people can make direct suggestions for what they think might be effective strategies to integrate into the plan? Uh, yes, definitely. I had, um, Jeff, on the, it's maybe the second to last slide, I had um, about four questions that um, I was hoping would sort of probe some of those um, oh, okay. It's not, no, no, not there. Um, well, I have them here and I can. Well, and maybe they could just be voiced, but I'm thinking that the, the Q and a panel, Jeff, I, I believe you will be able to generate a transcript okay, yeah, at the, so. at the end of the meeting. Right. Uh, we'll take a look into that. Okay. We, we do. Okay. Is this yeah, a slide? I found the questions. Yes. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to sort of um, gauge some of your thoughts and feelings about how we can actually accomplish this. Um, I just have a few open-ended questions here. So what actions can be most effective in getting everyone to carbon neutrality by 2035 or 2050? Uh, what measures do you believe would be most effective in helping you transition to low carbon um, and renewable power? Uh, what measures do you believe would be most effective to get you to transition to an electric vehicle, if that's possible for you? Um, and what other measures do you think are necessary? Um, and what other kinds of support do you need um, in order to help achieve that 100% community-wide goal of low carbon renewable energy um, and thinking outside of yourself, if possible? We, we did have another person raise their hand. Looks like okay. Lydia did. Um, would you like me to bring her in, Jada? Uh, yeah, certainly. Okay, Lydia, you should be able to unmute. Okay. It's actually Lucia, um, L-U-C-I-A. And hi to Peter, because um, Peter put in a rain garden for me and my property. <laughs> uh, I 
so I was listening to something recent, recently that talked about solar panels and how to encourage um, homeowners to get it. And one of the things that I heard in this discussion was maybe targeting like a street or a block within the community so that other people really start to notice it. And that's a lot of times when people are saying, oh, look, my neighbors, you know, three or four or five, or six or 10 neighbors are doing this. Maybe I should do it. So um, I just wanted to make that suggestion. Um, and a lot of the answers to these questions for me, I would be happy to do all these things. A lot of it has to do with, you know, financial, like I I'm hoping to get an electric vehicle. Um, I can't spend 50, 60, $70,000 for one. And I'm hoping in the next couple of years, you know, it'll be more affordable. Um, and I would pay more than I normally would um, just because of the savings on, well, first of all, helping the environment and savings on gas. And, you know, there's really virtually no servicing of the cars. So, um, that, you know, and I see in the, um, some of those emails that, that um, you're going to be having this group rates if you ought to get solar panels, because I kind of feel the same way. I must have answered some email in one of these seminars I was on. The next thing, I, I'm bombarded by people um, for solar panels, and they really do the hard sell, like, oh, can you sign right now? Otherwise, you know, this is going away, and it's, it's very confusing. So I'm definitely going to take advantage of that where you give, get individual help. Lucia, you should have attended our webinar. We don't do, we don't do the hard sell. But, uh, <laughs> Somehow but, I missed it. Uh, I did see one on solar, but I think it was through the city of Philadelphia. It was a green thing they did. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, that's the idea of Solarized Delco is it's really your neighbors who are volunteering their time to educate. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the folks who's on uh, the meeting tonight, Melissa Romano, who's on the EAC, is doing the spending a lot of time and doing the bulk of the screening uh, based on, you know, looking at an individual's house and their energy bills and, you know, trying to determine, is it right for the homeowner uh, to do this? But I will say about, you know, the financial wherewithal to do these things. I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm pretty cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, personally, I have to be brutally frank about myself, mm -hmm. but all of these things, uh, they, they all have payback. So it's not, um, you know, it's not just a question of uh, can we afford it? Uh, although for some people, you know, if all you can afford is a thousand dollar junker, um, that's, that's, a, that's one question, although you do wind up paying a lot to maintain that junker. Mm -hmm. But today, you know, for an electric vehicle, for example, I uh, bought a uh, Chevy Bolt. And uh, in fact, I think the township now owns one for recreation. So those really could be obtained for a sticker of about 35 to 40,000 net cost to you, I think, is probably closer to thirty thousand dollars. So it's it's really comparable. But as you said, if you look at uh, there's something called the five year cost of ownership that you'll find on like Kelly Blue Book and some of the Department of Energy sites. Um, the purchase price is not the whole story. There's a, the operating cost for an electric vehicle is extremely low. So you're saving on maintenance. You're probably not going to do a brake job until you hit 100,000 miles. Um, your cost of fuel, quote unquote, the power is probably a third of the cost of gasoline. So when you look at the total cost, the picture is very, very different. I mean, it's like, it's like paying to insulate your attic, right? Well, you're paying a substantial amount of money to do the work, but you're going to make all of that money back. So. It's, you know, there, that's, that is the challenge, I think, 
um, you know, and then there, you know, obviously you do have to have the money to invest. But one of the things we're trying to encourage people to do is to recognize that every time they do make a purchase of power or a car or anything, they are voting with their dollars on whether to continue the status quo or to do something about climate change. Thanks. Thank you. All right. It looks like we might have two more questions here. Uh, this one says, to answer the questions, I think broadly we want to do information campaigns to get people who can afford the switch to do so and financially support those who, those, excuse me, and financially support to enable those who cannot. And then Ron, Ron, excuse me, Rob chimed in with the link to the article on energy costs. I'm not sure if everyone can see that, attendees. Uh, I should be able to get that. You may be able to see it now. Yeah, this this point that Rob is making is the the sort of bait and switch reality that we have when you purchase power from a third party. So you enter into a contract and then unfortunately you set it and forget it, okay? And that's really what most of the providers are counting on. Um, and then once your contract lapses, the prices are going to go up, in some cases, astronomically. Uh, so it is a challenge. Uh, you know, the, certainly the easier thing to do is to, is to not. I do think that effective state regulation and PUC oversight could curb some of these excesses. Um, and I, I think it's possible to make some inroads in that regard. I personally would love to see a, a significant restriction on month to month and escalation abilities after the end of a contract and communication on the end of a contract. I, I think that, you know, the article that Rob, uh, Put in the in the Q and A, and and really the situation is absolutely true. You know, the intent was to foster reduced cost, and that reduced cost is available, but the market is a little out of control and uh, difficult for people to deal with. That is it as far as questions and anyone with their hand raised at the moment, Amy and Jada. Great. Also, thank you to whoever um, suggested that or whoever informed um, us that you would like to see more information campaigns um, to get people on board who are able to and uh, finding more avenues of financial support uh, for those who can't. That is um, really important part of uh, the plan and what it's meant to do. Oh, Amy, I don't know, should we leave it open for more questions or yeah, where would you like I, to go I from think, here? Um, I think, you know, we are starting to wrap up. So if anybody has any last minute thoughts or questions they want to pose, um, again, as, as I said before, we do want to be respectful of everybody's time, but we, uh, we still do have a few minutes if anybody wants to leave any parting thoughts. Um, if not, I just want to wrap it up by saying, again, this is still part of putting the framework together of what this update is going to be. So the, the goal of this was to try and get some insights from the community as to what's important to them or what's on their minds. And a, a common theme seemed to be, uh, the, the trash and recycling seemed to be a, a common theme. Um, electricity procurement seemed to be a common theme. So I, I know we touched on the environmental injustices that are in our area. So that is hopefully you know, we're going to be able to incorporate that into it after some more research on that. Um, but I think the whole goal of this was to try and get a pulse as to what the what the community was thinking. So, um, Jeff, I don't know, is that a hand raised or was that a layover from previous? Uh, it's the previous hand raise. Okay. okay. So 
Um, um, so I just I just wanted to say, and then Peter, if that's you, please feel free. I just wanted to say to the group, if there are any topics that you either want to expand on or really want um, both the EAC and Jada and myself and everybody involved in this update to take into consideration, please share your thoughts through our email, the Haverford LCAP at HAVTWP.org. Um, that's always a way to communicate if, like I said, if there's a topic that just either would take up too much time or we just didn't expand on to your liking, please feel free to reach out. So I'm sorry, Peter, go right ahead. Yeah, I was gonna just uh, try to gauge the temperature of an idea that's been on, on my mind. So information, outreach, visibility in the community, all great goals um, and, and maybe I'm a little jaded from having done this for too long, but it seems like, um, you know, to a certain extent, when we do these things, we're preaching to the choir. Um, you know, we have 50,000 residents in the township. So I think the challenge for us is how do we really gain traction more broadly? Um, and um, I, you know, I, I know that I've suggested this, which is a little uh, radical, I think for, you know, to, can you suggest that this be done on a township level? I don't know, but you know, the township is doing things uh, itself to be an example to the community, right? Which is all great. The township is probably going to achieve those 100% benchmarks well before the community. So, the question is, how do you move the community? And is there something that, you know, are there different approaches that we can do? And one of the things I think about is, um, you know, things like the um, uh, homestead uh, rebates, the, you know, it's been proposed uh, to have uh, stormwater fees that are based on the impacts that you have on discharging stormwater. Can you do something like that uh, for climate, where you say, you know, even if it's not um, a significant financial impact to the township or to the individual, something that puts it in front of every taxpayer that says, if you do this and that and that, you're eligible for certain rebates, you know, as, a, as, as much a way of marketing as really incentivizing. And that's, that's something that I think is worth exploring, at least uh, in the long term. But I'm wondering, you know, you know, nobody likes taxes, but this, what we're talking about is essentially sort of a moderate tax rebate program. Uh, I'm just curious what people think about that. We did get one question if we want to sneak it in here. Um, from sure. Ashton, what does the term, quote, environmental injustice actually mean? You're muted, Amy. Sorry, Jade, I was just gonna say from an educational standpoint, do you know the, the specific definition of it? Um, I, can, uh, I can put one together because um, it's, yeah, it might be a little contentious for some, but um, it's essentially that one uh, area or one community is not experiencing the same um, environmental hazards as another, a more marginalized community. Um, so they are experiencing, um, so the, at their expense, uh, they are living in an area with a lot of environmental hazards because of that marginalization. And um, they do not have the means themselves to uh, put an end to that. So um, which sort of, speaks to this systemic nature of environmental injustice. Right, and I just did, I asked Jada to describe it because her and I um, have sat through the ICLE training and uh, this concept is part of the ICLE model that we are to, to evaluate. Uh, we had a whole session on this exact topic and just whether it applies and whether we should include it in a community's environmental uh, climate action plan. So um, that is, like I said, part of the ICLE structure. So yeah, I hope that was uh, helpful. 
here. And we had one more comment. I believe it was in regards to what Peter was speaking of before the previous question. Just anonymous said, I think that's a good idea because it goes back to the financial support I was talking about earlier, some too. So just wanted to share that so we got it all in. So that is it as far as questions and hand raises at the moment. I say that another question comes in. I think Peter's suggestion of incentivizing to encourage people to make changes that will impact climate in a positive way is a good, a good one. I was just gonna say, I, I've read that some communities, communities incentivize like through their building permits, like using green materials, maybe a reduction in building permit fees or, or something like that. So that might be something we could also explore as part of the, the update to our plan too, to see if that's um, something of interest to the community as well. Yeah, that's a great idea. I know we, we had talked about the fact that there is, um, that, you know, the, the uniform building codes and there's a, a several different national building codes, but there's actually a green building code. So there's a sort of a stepped up version of the code um, that is sort of a ready-made platform for that sort of incentivizing for more efficient uh, construction. Um, so that, that's definitely something to consider, you know, from a fee standpoint, right? If you could incentivize that uh, all the better. And we have a question for Peter. Uh, how, would you, how would tax rebates be funded? How are tax rebates ever funded? <laughs> I, I, no, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be flippant, but uh, right, so they would obviously affect revenues, which is one of the, <laughs> there's no free lunch, mate. Yes, there is no free lunch. Uh, although I also look at it another way. So I'm financially conservative, um, I don't think, you know, virtually no one in the country is apparently anymore. We don't believe in balanced budgets with the exception of township budgets and state budgets. Um, but um, I think we also have to recognize that we are all paying a tax. We are, we are paying a tax today and that tax is going up every year. And that tax is paying for disaster relief. That tax is paying for what we like to call resiliency now, which is hardening ourselves against floods and tides and storms. Um, and, you know, those costs, uh, I'm not sure those costs are really being adequately tracked, but we, um, you know, we're all paying for it today. Uh, and so uh, one of the uh, great debates in this area is, um, you know, oh, is somebody getting a free ride? Well, electric vehicles, they're not paying the gasoline tax, so they're not contributing to the roads um, being built. And my response is, well, when you credit me for the billions of dollars in disaster relief that I'm saving or contributing to save, I'll, I'll be happy to pay my share fare in road construction. We really don't have a fair uh, fee for service based model right now with regard to carbon emissions and mitigation measures. It's, it's sort of a patchwork. So, you know, to the fairness question, I can only say that life is not fair. <laughs> but what we're trying to do is create, you know, to our friends in township administration, you know, we're not trying to, you know, uh, impair your ability to fund yourself and operate. What we're trying to do is create visibility and, um, put it in front of people's faces because we need to speak to everyone, not just people who already um, have this on their front burner. We do have another question. Is the town, 
Is the township implementing a plan to incorporate more native plants and trees on township properties and public areas where there is landscaping? Um, I, I don't know if there's a formal plan, but I, I know um, thought does go into those plans when, when plantings are done. Our park and rec department takes a lead in a lot of those areas in our park maintenance department, and they're all very skilled and knowledgeable about those topics. So while I don't know if there's a formal plan, I, I know a lot of thought does go into when we do do planting. Yeah, and I know I, I just saw um, there were several uh, riparian zone, uh, buffer zone planting projects that uh, were they're seeking grants for. Um, so yes, there is some, I think, you know, there is concern with regard to trees, which is we're always going backwards and as the, at the same time that we're going forwards, you know, so mature trees are getting cut down due to fear, due to, um, you know, power impl impacts on the power system and so forth. So I know uh, there was a uproar in, I want to say it was Newtown Township after one of last year's storms, uh, Pico decided enough was enough and they actually took down uh, roadside trees along, I think it might have been Goshen Road for several miles and it created a huge uproar. But, you know, so we, yeah, it would be uh, good to recognize, I think everyone recognizes how important trees are, but I don't know that we have a formal plan uh, in place for that. I will give a little plug while we're just talking about trees. The Shade Tree Commission along with the township will be sponsoring a tree giveaway. I believe it's May 1st. So um, those who are interested, just be on the lookout. Uh, you can sign up and pick up a free tree if you're uh, pre-registered and, and get in early enough on their list. Okay, so keep an eye out for that. We'll, we'll get that information on our Facebook and Twitter, Facebook page and our Twitter accounts. Okay. And I think we are approaching the end of our Zoom window. So uh, again, I just wanna thank the residents who were able to participate tonight. Um, please, as I've, I've said a few times, if you have any more comments, please continue to forward them. And I thank Peter for his time. Rob, I know he chimed in a lot too. Jada, thank you. I hope as, as a student intern in this, you're, you're learning a lot, but you're also teaching all of us a lot too. So thank you very much. And Jeff, thank you for coordinating everything for us and uh, letting our meeting go on smoothly. So with that, um, unless there's any final comments from Jada, Peter. Yep, I just uh, wanted to echo uh, all that gratitude. Thank you um, all so much for joining me here. And uh, this has been really helpful. And hopefully you can see uh, some of your ideas and some of your concerns fleshed out in that final plan. And I just, again, wanted to thank you, Amy and Peter and Jeff and Rob, if you're still out there, for helping me um, facilitate this. This was, um, this was great. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Great session. Good night. All right. Take care.